the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, was a time of great scientific progress and optimism. The theories of Charles Darwin were taking hold. Great technological advances like the light bulb and the telephone were being made. And the belief that humanity could unlock all the mysteries of the universe was high. And so in an environment of such robust intellectual activity, many in the church began to wonder if the church's message was still relevant. In a world so governed by the rules of science, how could anyone expect people to take seriously a story in which a virgin gave birth and dead people came back to life? Many church people decided that if Christianity were to survive, it would have to divorce itself from the more supernatural aspects of its story. And so something called higher criticism came into being. Higher criticism set out to trace the development of the Bible, claiming that very few of the books of the Bible were written by any single individual, but rather that they were all an accumulation of various oral stories and traditions and legends that had sort of been cobbled together. Higher criticism claimed the ability to sort out the accumulation of legends and myths and get back to the bare bones, non-supernatural truth of what had actually happened. And thus, the new modern church advocated a version of Christianity that was high on moral lessons, but left little room for the direct involvement of God in the affairs of humanity. Not everyone was happy about this, however, and something called the modernist fundamentalist controversy broke out. The main controversy occurred in the Presbyterian church, centered around Princeton Seminary. But most denominations in America were affected by it. It changed the landscape of religion in America significantly. The precipitating event came in 1909 when the Presbytery of New York ordained three new pastors who refused to agree to the doctrine of the virgin birth. The National Assembly upheld and confirmed their ordination, but those in opposition drafted a document they called the Five Fundamentals. And at the 1910 assembly, a year later, um, they declared that these five doctrines were necessary and essential to the Christian faith. Those five fundamentals were the inspiration of the Bible by the Holy Spirit, the virgin birth of Christ, the belief that Christ's death is an atonement for sin, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, and the historical reality of Christ's miracles. Now, I should mention that today, uh, anyone who's labeled a fundamentalist is usually considered to be on the extreme edges of religion. Today, if you're called a fundamentalist, it's a pejorative term. But at the time, and this is where this idea of fundamentalism came into being, it, it was simply someone who argued for the integrity of the Bible story. Today, the term applied to the folks who held to these would probably be evangelical. And so for the next 15 years or so, the modernists and the fundamentalists wrestled for control of Princeton Seminary and the Presbyterian denomination. The fundamentalists were led by men like J. Gresham Macon, B.B. Warfield, and William Jennings Bryan. The modernists were funded by John D. Rockefeller and led by a pastor out of New York named Harry Emerson Fosdick. And in the end, the modernists won, if there is victory here, the, the Princeton Seminary came under control of those on the more moderate, more liberal side of things. J. Gresham Macon and several other professors left Princeton to begin Westminster Theological Seminary. The Presbyterian Church broke into pieces with more liberal and conservative schools of thought. Many other mainline denominations did the same. So why am I telling you this story? First of all, just let me say that I affirm all five of the fundamentalists. Fundamental. If you, want, if you want, you can call me a fundamentalist. But I tell you the story because we're in a series about the Apostles' Creed, and today we come to the part about Jesus that says he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born to the Virgin Mary. And I find it interesting that this particular point of belief became such a major dividing point in the church. So let me back up a bit and review what we've said so far about the Creed. Remember, it's called the Apostles' Creed, not because we believe it was written by the Apostles, but because we believe it's an accurate reflection of apostolic teaching. 
And so it's been around for about 1,500 years, and, and, and I said it's like a treasure box. It contains the riches of the gospel. It's, it's like a ruler or a standard against which the church measures its teaching. It's like a padlock. It, it, it locks down what the church believes and protects the church against the error. And so whenever we stand to recite the creed, as we did just a little bit ago, um, then we're standing with Christians across the centuries and across continents to, to take a stand for God, to stand up against the common narrative, the, the popular narratives of the world, and, and to affirm our faith in the God of the Bible. And so I told you a few weeks ago, when we say, I believe, we're saying three things. We're saying, I agree. I agree that these things are true. I, I pledge, I pledge my allegiance to this God, and I trust. I, I, I put my faith, my hope, I give my life to the God of the Bible. And it's interesting that when, when agreement with the creed begins to erode, when, when people begin to argue with the things written in the creed, that it's often this line about the conception and birth of Jesus that is attacked first. After all, the argument goes, we're sophisticated and intelligent people. We know that women don't just get pregnant. We understand the facts of life. So the notion that a young maiden could just suddenly turn up with a child inside her womb is simply not plausible. It's, it, it, it's, it's, on the, it's equivalent to the idea that Perseus, the Greek uh, hero of mythology, was, was conceived by, by the Greek god Zeus. It's, it's, we're too sophisticated to believe in such silly fables. More than that, the modern mind would argue it's easy to see how this kind of fable could have worked its way into the Bible. The people who were trying to promote belief in Jesus needed Jesus to have some street cred. They needed him to, you know, they needed to present him as powerful and important. And so they maybe would go around telling people, well, yeah, you know, you think your God's a big deal. Well, my God was born on earth without, without a biological father. You know, he was born to a virgin. He was, he was put there by the Holy Spirit. And so, so people would begin to tell these stories about Jesus. They would begin to, to build these stories up, and eventually it got written down by Matthew and Luke and put into the Bible. And then there's the question. I mean, does it really matter? It's not like the circumstances of Jesus' birth are vital to our salvation. In fact, just this last Christmas, Andy Stanley... Andy Stanley is one of, pastor of one of the largest churches in America. He's pastor of North Point Church down in Atlanta. Um, he's a leader in the evangelical world. He, he puts out a lot of tapes and, and leadership seminars and that sort of thing. And so Andy Stanley, his Christmas series, he introduced his Christmas series by saying that he could sympathize with those who have a hard time believing in the virgin birth. He began his Christmas series this last December by saying this. He says, if someone can predict their own death and resurrection, I'm not all that concerned about how they got into the world. Christianity doesn't hinge on the truth or even the stories around the birth of Jesus. It hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. And of course, Andy puts all of his sermons on the internet, and so that got out there into the internet, and the internet got a hold of it, and then the internet sort of lost its collective mind for two weeks. People were blogging about how Andy Stanley didn't believe in the virgin birth, and they were questioning whether Andy Stanley should be a pastor anymore or anything like that. I, um, the internet, right? Um, so I, I, I actually, this week, I watched all three of his Christmas sermons. I can assure you that Andy Stanley believes in the virgin birth. He wasn't questioning it. He was just raising that question of um, how important is it and, and, and his sympathy with those who have a difficult time believing in it. And so the question is, does the virgin birth matter? And just to relieve you of the suspense, my answer is yes. Yes, the virgin birth matters. My sermon title, Why the Virgin Birth Matters, probably gives away that answer. I, I affirm the five fundamentals. I believe, when I say the Apostles' Creed, I, I mean it when I say I believe that Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Yes, I believe the virgin birth matters. In a little bit, I'll give you three reasons why I think it matters. Three reasons I think it's important for us to continue to believe in the virgin birth. But before we do that, let's take a look at the Bible. There are two main passages that talk about Christ's miraculous conception. You can read about the virgin birth in Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 1. And we're going to, for our purposes today, we're going to look at the story in Luke. So Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 26. Here's what it says. 
In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel said to her, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Stop here for a moment. The story begins on a supernatural note. Gabriel is an angel. Gabriel is sent from God. And so right away, this is a story about God breaking into our world. This is about God acting in the world of humanity. And we're told that Mary is a virgin. Luke repeats that word twice in verse 27. The Greek word in the original language is parthenos. It's a word properly translated as virgin. It's a word that means exactly what you think it means. It means she was a young woman pledged to be married, who's been chased. So even though she's legally bound to Joseph, in some ways she was considered married to Joseph, the, their, their, their betrothal was considered a legal agreement, there was also an understanding that they would not come together as husband and wife until they'd officially been married, which was still some time distant. She is not, in other words, in any position to become pregnant by normal means. So verse 29 Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, we need to set what's happening here within the larger context of the Bible and of, of, of Jewish culture and belief here for a moment. The fundamental problem with humanity, according to the Bible, the fundamental problem with humanity, according to the Jewish worldview, is sin. We are in rebellion against God. We break His law. We fall short of His standards. So that's the fundamental problem, according to the Bible, and it's not something we can fix on our own. So think of it this way. Imagine you find yourself in a bookstore. That's hard to do anymore, but imagine you go to Sioux Falls or you go to Sioux City and you stop off at the Barnes & Noble and you walk in and you walk into a big bookstore. One of the biggest sections in any big bookstore is going to be the self-help section. Right? There, there, there's always a self-help section where, there, where they've got all of these books that tell you what's wrong with you, but then tell you how you can fix it yourself. Right? So if your problem is you weigh too much, then you can find the diet books. And if your problem is your relationship, then you can find books that will help you explain the opposite sex. If your problem is financial, you can find books that will tell you how to get out of debt fast. There's a whole self-help section. The basic concept is you give them $30, they tell you what's wrong with you, then they tell you how to fix yourself. Right? But the Bible says our fundamental problem is not a self-help problem. Our fundamental problem is a problem we can't fix ourselves. There's no self-help book available for getting us out of sin. It's not a problem that we can fix because the problem is sin. We sin. Our, our problem is sin is in us. Sin is us. We're in rebellion against God and we can't fix it on our own. So what's happening here now in Luke 1 is the angel Gabriel is making the announcement that God is sending help. If our fundamental problem is one we can't self-help our way out of, then the answer the Bible gives here is Gabriel coming to make this announcement that God is sending help. This is God, through no help from mankind, taking the initiative to come and fix our fundamental problem. So the angel says, you will conceive, you will give birth to a son, you are to call him Jesus. And in Matthew's version of this story, where the angel appears to Joseph, and Joseph is also told to name this boy Jesus, the angel gives a reason, because Jesus means Savior, and he says, name him Jesus, because he's going to save his people from their sin. This is the initiating love of God. In our rebellion against him, instead of leaning away, instead of stepping back, God leans in. He steps towards us. God sends. The Holy Spirit conceives and empowers. Jesus comes into our world. So This isn't entirely central to my sermon today, but it's just too important for us to pass by. Part of what the virgin birth teaches is that God has not abandoned us to our mess. Because he could have. 
right? He could have. He could have looked at the mess we've made of things ever since Adam and Eve. He could have looked at the brokenness and the pain and the despair that sin brings into our world. He could have looked at the mess that humanity has created for themselves, and he could have said, you know, you've made your bed. Now you got to lie in it. He could have done that. But that's not what he does. He doesn't leave us in our rebellion. He reaches out. He comes towards us. Psalm 40. Psalm 40 is a song by David. About 30 years ago, it found new life when Bono wrote a version of Psalm 40. um, And and you two recorded it, put it on their live album, Rattle and Hum. Um, Psalm 40 says that, 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 that we are in a slimy pit. That's the imagery that, 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 that we found ourselves in this slimy pit and the muck and the mire, and then God comes and he reaches down and he lifts us out of it. He puts our feet on solid ground. And that's what's happening here is this is God, the holy, 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 holy God, getting his holy hands dirty as he reaches down into the muck and the mire of sin, and, and, and he comes into our world in, in Jesus Christ. God is taking the initiative to come and help us. But there's nothing so far in the story that requires this to be a virgin birth. Not, not yet. I, what I mean to say is, if, if Mary is pledged to be married to Joseph, and maybe what the angel is saying is, Mary, you're going to get married, and you're going to move in with Joseph, and nature's going to take its course, and you're going to find yourself pregnant, and you're going to have a son, and, and he's going to be this special child. Right? It, so far, what, what he said, it could work that way. But, but notice, that's not what Mary hears the angel saying. So she asked the obvious question, verse 34. She says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? See, the, the, the people of the Bible were plenty sophisticated. They knew where babies came from. They knew the fa- facts of life. And so Mary points out the one big glaring flaw with Gabriel's plan. She says, I can't get pregnant. I'm a virgin. And now here's where we enter into the miraculous. Verse 35. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is now in her sixth month. See, this is not going to be a child conceived in the normal way. Gabriel says, you know, she says, well, how can this be? I'm a, I'm a virgin. And he doesn't say, well, you know, you'll get married to Joseph, and then that's what's going to happen. No, he says, no, this child is going to be different. There, there are a lot of special children whose births are announced in the Bible. Elizabeth and Zechariah, they had one, John the Baptist. There, Abraham and Sarah, they had one when they were very old. Um, there are a lot of special children whose births are announced to come out in a special way, but always they're still conceived the way all children are conceived. It's a husband and a wife, and, um, but not with Mary. With Mary, it's going to be different. The angel is very specific, very clear. With, with this child, with Jesus, he's going to be conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Actually, referring to this as the virgin birth is a little misleading. Because it's not really the birth of Jesus that is miraculous. As far as we know, Jesus was born as all other babies have been born with labor pains and placenta and umbilical cords and so on. The miracle is not in his birth. The miracle is in his conception. That's the part that has no precedent, no equivalent, virginal conception. This child is placed in Mary's womb by God himself. This is not the product of a female ovum fertilized by a male sperm. This is the product of God placing this child there. That's why the creed emphasizes that Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a conception and birth for which there is no equivalent, no precedent, nothing like it. So how is this going to work? How is a child going to be conceived with no human agency? How can Jesus have no human biological father? Verse 37, Gabriel says, For no word from God will ever fail. Now here's a case where, where the New English translation, uh, this is the NIV 2011, is different than the Bible I grew up with. It's actually different than the Bible you have in your pews. Um, most older translations, the Bible I grew up with, the Bible in your pews, at this point, Gabriel says, for nothing is impossible with God. And quite honestly, I prefer the older version, but that's probably my prejudice. I, I looked it up this week, I was like, I read this, I'm like, they changed it. 
Um, but this is actually closer to the Greek idiom of kind of the way it's written. It basically says, not possible is anything God says, which is sort of wooden. And so the, the older translation said, well, nothing is impossible for God. This one says, for no word from God will ever fail. It means basically essentially the same thing. It says, if God says something, then he will not fail to accomplish it. If God says it, he will do it. God is able to do whatever he says he will do. So remember, this is the God who gave a son to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. Abraham's 100 years old. He's having babies. This is a God who, who, who led the children of Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea on dry ground. This is the God who, when Elijah built his altar and poured water over it, who rained fire down on that sacrifice. This is the God who spoke creation into existence. And so, if this God wants to conceive a child inside a virgin's womb, then that's something he can certainly do. I mean, God can step outside the rules of nature because God wrote the rules of nature. He's a God who knows nothing of the impossible. And so there can be very little doubt that the Bible teaches the miraculous conception of Jesus Christ. I mean, Mary knows how unlikely it is. Even the angel Gabriel seems to understand how improbable it is. And yet God said it, and God's word will not fail. The baby in Mary's womb is going to get there in an utterly unique, unrepeatable way. It is God himself breaking into the muck and mire of humanity's sin. It's the God of creation doing what for anybody else would be impossible. So now, does it matter? If someone finds the virgin conception a little hard to believe in, can that person still be a Christian? A hundred years ago when the church was trying to decide what the fundamental truths of the faith are, why is it that this, the, 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 the miraculous conception and birth of Jesus Christ became such a dividing point? What difference does it make? As I promised, I've got three reasons why it does indeed matter. So first, the Bible's reliability First of all, the trustworthiness of the Bible is at stake. Is the Bible a reliable witness to the story of Jesus, or isn't it? Clearly, proponents of higher criticism want us to believe that the Bible is just a patchwork of legends and fables, but is that what we believe it is? If we begin to treat the Bible like a cafeteria where you pick and choose the parts that are true, then how can we believe or trust anything it says? More than that, what authority on our lives can the Bible have if some parts are made up and others are not, especially if there are no real clues as to which is which? Now, some people like to point out that the virgin birth is only taught in two places in the Bible. As I said, Matthew and Luke, they're the only places where the virgin birth is talked about. Mark and John also have Gospels of Jesus. Neither of them mention the virgin virgin birth, uh, Paul, the later parts of the New Testament, the other writers later in the New Testament, none of them bring it up or talk about it. And so the argument goes, well, if it's only mentioned twice in the Bible, how important can it really be? Well, there are a couple of responses to this. For one thing, the rest of the New Testament may not mention the virgin birth, but it certainly doesn't deny the virgin birth. In fact, I, I would argue that the Gospel of John shows a strong awareness of the special circumstances of Jesus' birth when it says the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians talks about when the time had fully come, God sent His Son born of a woman, clearly indicating there's something going on with that birth. Even the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12, where, where it has this imagery of a dragon and a woman, seems to be indicating that there's something special about the birth of Jesus. But more important than that is even if the virgin birth is mentioned only twice, so what? How many times must the Bible say something for us to believe it? What, what's the magic number? Three times? Five times? Does it have to be mentioned ten times before we're going to say it's important? J. Gresham Macon, one of the leaders in that fight a hundred years ago against the modernists, wrote this. Everyone admits that the Bible represents Jesus as having been conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. The only question is whether in making that representation the Bible is true or false. And if the Bible is regarded as being wrong in what it says about the birth of Christ, then obviously the authority of the Bible in any high sense is gone. And Albert Moeller, who's president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, who recently led a, a fight within the Southern Baptist Conference against its own modernist movement, 
he says this, if Jesus was not born of the virgin, then the Bible cannot be trusted when it comes to telling us the story of Jesus. And that mistrust cannot be limited to how he came to us in the terms of the incarnation. The fact is that biblical Christianity, ultimately the gospel of Jesus itself, cannot survive the denial of the virgin birth. Because without the virgin birth, you end up with a very different Jesus than the fully human, fully divine Savior revealed to us in Scripture. If you doubt the virgin birth, then you doubt the Bible. Which leads to a second reason the virgin birth matters, and that's God's ability. If we doubt that God can make a virgin pregnant, then we need to doubt every miraculous occurrence described to us in Scripture. If you find it hard to believe that God could send Jesus into the world without a human father, then we have to seriously question God's ability to do anything in our world. So then the question becomes, well, why pray? Why ask God to get involved in your life if he's not able to get involved in your life? Why, why worship? What good is a God if we don't believe he can influence the way things work in our world? And obviously, this was part of the motivation of the modernist movement. They found the notion of supernatural and miraculous activities too superstitious for their scientific worldview. They wanted to believe in God who never did anything godlike. But is that the kind of God you want to believe in? Because honestly, what's the point? And of course, if you doubt the miracle at the beginning of Jesus' life, then we have to seriously doubt the miracle at the end of his life as well. Ray Pritchard says, the problem for us can be stated this way. Matthew and Luke tell us that Jesus entered the world in a supernatural way through a mighty miracle of God. And then these same writers tell us that Jesus' earthly life came to a climax with another mighty miracle, his bodily resurrection from the dead. Regarding the latter, we all understand the significance of the resurrection. Because he lives, we too shall live. His resurrection guarantees ours. But it's not the same with the virgin birth. His supernatural birth doesn't tell us anything about our physical birth. And since we've already been born, it's easy to discount the virgin birth when we compare it to the resurrection. But that is a major mistake. If you can't believe the first miracle, how can you believe the last miracle? The Bible doesn't present the life of Christ to us as a kind of pick-your-miracle cafeteria where you can pick this miracle and reject that one. The stories of our Lord's earthly life come to us as a seamless whole. Either we take it all or we reject it all. There's no suitable middle ground option. And then third, finally, the virgin birth says a lot about Christ's identity. An essential part of historic Christianity is the belief that Jesus is both divine and human. He has a fully divine nature, he's got a fully human nature. And, and this is mysterious, it's, it's about as mysterious as the Trinity. You know, we believe that God is three persons with one essence. Well, now we're saying that Jesus is one person, but he's got two different natures. That he's, he's 100% human and he's 100% divine. It, it doesn't work to say, well, you know, Jesus was God, came to earth, and he just sort of put on a disguise like a human for 33 years and sort of walked around pretending to be a man, but he was really just God all along. That, that's not what we believe, and neither does it work to say, well, Jesus was just a really special person that, that God came and blessed in a special way with the Holy Spirit, and so he was just a person, he's just a human, but, but, but he had, you know, no, we believe he's 100% human, 100% divine. He, he's fully God, he's fully man. And the only way that works is if the virgin birth is true. Jesus needed to be born to a woman, and he needed to be conceived by the Spirit of God. Kevin DeYoung writes, If Jesus had not been born of a human, we could not believe in his full humanity. But if his birth were like any other human birth, through the union of a human father and a mother, we would question his full divinity. The virgin birth is necessary to secure both a real human nature and also a completely divine nature nature. Throughout this series on the Apostles' Creed, I've been making references to the Heidelberg Catechism, which is sort of a statement of faith for our church. And when the Catechism gets to this part of the Apostles' Creed, the part that talks about being conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, um, it focuses in, and, and why that matters, the Catechism focuses in on this issue of Christ's identity. Here's what it says. It's question and answer number 35. What does it mean that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary? And the answer, that the eternal Son of God, who is and remains true and eternal God, took to himself, through the working of the Holy Spirit, from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, a truly human nature. 
so that he also might become David's true descendant, like his brothers and sisters in every way, except for sin. You see, he is, he is and remains true and eternal God, but then he takes to himself a truly human nature. This is important because the Bible says it's only by being both God and human that Jesus can serve as the mediator between a sinful humanity and a holy God. Right now we're back to the self-help thing. Right? Here, here's our fundamental problem. It's a problem we can't fix ourselves. We need someone from the outside to come in and help us. And so we need Jesus. We need someone who can, who, who, who can live a life without sin. Only God can do that. But we need one who can take the place of, of, of human beings. And so we need someone, a mediator, someone who can be both God and man. Question answer number 36. How does the holy conception and birth of Jesus Christ benefit you? Answer, he's our mediator. In God's sight, he covers with his innocence and perfect holiness my sinfulness in which I was conceived. This is the initiating love of God. We were in sinful rebellion against God. We cannot fix our problem ourselves. And so God, in his divine love, takes it upon himself to enter into our world. And because he's fully God, he has no sin of his own to pay for. Because he's fully human, he can truly take your place and mine. And so only Jesus can go to the cross and make atonement for our sin. Only Jesus can fix our greatest problem. Only Jesus can lift us up out of the muck and mire of this slimy, sinful world. Only Jesus, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus, born to the Virgin Mary. Let's pray. Now, the Father, Lord Jesus, uh, as we contemplate uh, this part of the creed, we see there's so much at stake. Um, the reliability and truthfulness of Scripture. The question of whether or not you actually work in our world or if you're just the God who stands far off watching us play our lives out. Or the identity of Jesus is the one who comes to, to mediate between us and God. Jesus, we thank you that that when you saw our fundamental problem, you didn't leave us alone in it, but you entered into our world. You did what only you could do in taking our place because you are fully the Son of God and you are a fully human being like us. So we thank you, Jesus, for, for the miracle. It's a miracle. There's, there's no other explanation for it. For the miracle of your conception and birth. We thank you that you came uh, to do something uh, mighty in our world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us respond with song. Please stand. Oh, the mercy our God has shown to those who sit in death's shadow. Son on high, the night born was a cornerstone unto us the son is given unto us a child is born he who is mighty has done a great thing taking on flesh cup and destiny shattered darkness and lifted our shame holy is his name oh the freedom our savior won the yoke of sin has been once a slave, now by grace, no more condemnation. Unto us the Son is given, unto us a child is born. He who is mighty has done a great thing, taken on flesh, conquered destiny, shattered the dark. And lifted our shame Holy is His name Now my soul magnifies the Lord I rejoice in the God who saves I will trust His unfailing love I will sing His praises all my days Now my 
taken on flesh, conquered destiny, shattered the darkness and lifted our shame. Yes, the uh, virgin birth does matter. It, it, it matters. You have to ask yourself, do I believe what the Bible says? Do I believe the Bible's trustworthy? Do I believe God's the kind of God who acts in our world, a God who can make a difference in our world? And then do you believe that Jesus really did come uh, to stand in between God and you, to lift you up out of the muck and mire of this sinful world? Um, I believe it. And uh, I think God is a mighty God who has done a great thing in sending his son to us. So as you go, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.